It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Marjoliva, director and producer of this film, UFO Disclosure, The Coming Great Deception, and the Luciferian Endgame. I shot the footage in 2016 and we edited it and released the film in 2017. Of December of that year, 2017, on Tucker Carlson's show, he had a guest on, Commander David Fravor, who was a former F-18 fighter pilot. Fravor had an encounter over the Pacific Ocean with a tic-tac-shaped UFO. Tucker asked Commander David Fravor, in your own words, what do you think this was? Fravor looked right at the camera and said, whatever this was, was not of this earth. One, that's a groundbreaking statement. We've never heard anything like that before, especially on the mainstream media, as it were. Since then, our government has stated on the record that UFOs or UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomena, are real. Folks, what are we to make of this? The reason I circled back and re-edited this film is I believe that this closure is now being rolled out. We see it month after month after month. The purpose of this film is to arm you with what I believe is the truth, that these are not extraterrestrials from some other galaxy. They are in fact interdimensional entities that are messengers of deception. As you know, this film is for free. All I would ask is that you pass it forward. Share it with your loved ones, family members, your pastor. We are told, we are warned, in ancient prophetic texts, that men would faint from fear from what is coming upon the earth. That the dragon would come with all signs and lying wonders. That even the elect would be deceived if that were possible. What are we to make of those statements? They are dire warnings from thousands of years ago. I truly believe we are in a window of time that is unprecedented, unlike any other time in history. We are being told by our government that the UFO or UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon, is actually real. That we have in our possession off-world vehicles. In my opinion, when they really show up, when, they, when there's full disclosure, everything will change. However. These are not extraterrestrials from some faraway galaxy. They are, in my opinion, interdimensional entities that have a nefarious agenda. They are messengers of deception and masters of deceit. They lie and do so habitually. And I would ask you, who is the father of lies? In this film, you will see what I believe is incontrovertible evidence that the phenomenon is not only real, but it has a very dark side, a very nefarious agenda, which is why we call it the coming great deception and the Luciferian endgame. I've seen a UFO. I've seen a UFO. And I saw a UFO. A UFO.
And so we all went up to the window oh, oh, and we could see oh. this giant UFO and saw three or four orbs that were up in the sky doing circles and, and erratic movements up and down in circular motion. And all of a sudden we see this light in the sky and I asked my husband, is that a plane? And he said, I don't think so. And so we kept watching it and it hovered over the treetops and you could see the flashing lights around it. It was round. See the flashing lights around it. And then you could see the windows and lights in the windows, but you couldn't see inside the windows. And this particular night, we looked over into a field and saw three hovering uh, lights. This thing was huge and it, it was, well, I didn't know until I started using the camera, but this thing was moving around and shifting and all kinds of things. And I was driving that night, it was quite late at night, and I started to see some some kind of orange flary lights in the desert. And so I kept looking at them while I was driving. And they seemed to be jumping up and down and they didn't there was no sound of a helicopter or a plane. And I saw these two balls of light, these orbs, and they were perfectly round and it was hard because it was dark to get a perspective on how far away they were, but they looked to be about six feet in diameter, and they were floating, to me it looked like about 50 feet from my car. And it kept coming closer, it was just this green, red, or no, green or orange orb with like a red T in it. It kept coming and coming, and then it shot straight west across the Pacific Ocean that came forward, it just came out of nowhere and it was a white light, light. And then within seconds, another one joined it above it. And then a third one joined it to the right of it. So they stayed in a triangular shape and they hovered for a while. It floated in a way I've never seen anything float. It didn't have a sound. It didn't have, um, it had no air. You, can't, you couldn't hear anything like a, a helicopter's propellers. I to the wife, I said, Jen, come out here and see, look at this. And, uh, and that was actually before it had disappeared. So she watched it too for a few, I, I suppose, a minute or so. And it moved around in different directions. And the object was like hovering over the trees. It wasn't moving. It went at an incredible speed, stopped, and then did a turn. Um, that would absolutely be impossible. But as the lights came closer and closer, it struck me that there was no sound whatsoever. And it had different colors of lights that went all the way around it. It hovered for about 20 minutes as we watched it, and then it went down in between some mountains. Since and maybe half a mile, three quarters of a mile away, it was a triangle, a black triangle about like this, and it had a tail on the bottom of it with a slit in it, and I could see the clouds going past. Al, you've had multiple experiences, and some of these experiences were very troubling to you. I want to go back uh, to really the beginning of your life where you okay. had your first encounter and what was that like? What, what were you thinking when you saw this thing? I was uh, just a young guy. I was out on a hockey rink in Ottawa, uh, middle of winter, uh, with my twin brother and probably about eight other kids. Beautiful sunny day, not a cloud in the sky. And one, one of the guys looks up and says, what's that? Mm. We all stopped and looked up. We saw three UFOs, that's what we even called them back then, uh, hovering in formation, like a triangle. The sun was beaming off these things. We looked at them and we're all like me mesmerized going, what are those? And all of a sudden they moved like that in the sky, just darted and then stopped again. Everyone ran into the shack, the changing room, except for me. I stayed out on the middle of the ice and stared at these things. And I said, I need, in my mind, I said, I need to know what these things are. Right after that, I got an angelic feeling. That's the only way I can describe it. Angelic feeling of these things, of 
warmth and love. Euphoria? And that euphoria is another word you could use. What did the craft look like? They were like uh, disc-shaped objects. Uh, they were all exactly the same, same size, Color. no sound. Uh, silver, silver, silver with dull the, silver, bright silver, uh, bright silver with the sun just beaming off these things, and no sound. It was very spooky. Never seen anything How like that. How close were they to you? I would say a mile away, because this pollution plant where they were hovering over was a mile away from the rink. Okay, and they were right over that. Uh, hovering right over, maybe a hundred feet up. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Pretty crazy. Wow. Now, this was the first of many experiences that would follow that. That's correct. And um, you. I, I want to sort of cut to the chase here. There was one incident which and it had to do with this woman um, who basically changed her appearance right in front of you. Tell us about that. <laughs> that was mind blowing. Um, that was in 2008, September. I'll always remember that. I was with uh, working for Williams Moving and Storage for their overseas division. Mm -hmm. We had a container coming in from Kuwait. The lady's name was Diane Kelly. I met her with one of my employees, I brought him along to give a hand. He had heard all my stories and he didn't diss me. He, he said, you know, I've heard strange stuff like this, my parents know about it. He didn't make fun of me or any, anything like that. And um, anyway, we met, met this woman. She showed up in her car. Um, I said, hi, I'm Al, this is so and so. We're here to unload hi, your container, can welcome to Canada, shook her hand. And I noticed she was a very pretty lady, well-dressed. She was wearing the weirdest glasses I've ever seen in my life. They were just like off the charts. I'm like... How, how so? What did they look like? They were black and wrapped around. Okay. So it would cover the side of her eyes so no sun would get in. Okay. So I sort of figured out oh, maybe she has an eye problem or something. Sure, sure. But anyway, we moved on from there. The conversation went this way. I said, for some reason, it was September, the rainy season's coming in Vancouver, and I was just making simple conversation. I said, why are you moving from Kuwait? It's so nice over there now, the war's over, and you know, you're coming back here. And she goes, she changed totally. She goes, there's gonna be another war, another war. And for some reason I said, well, don't you believe in a higher power? I don't know why I said that, but that's what I said. And she looked at me and she goes, what do you mean now, UFOs? And I'm like, what? So out of the blue, she just she just this, said that. This. And I said, and what? And she still has a dark glasses. Yes, on. that's okay. right. I look at my other guy that's working for me, and he just sort of shrugs his shoulders. He heard her. And I go, what do you mean by that? And she goes, we were supposed to meet. I know that you know. And I go, know what? She goes, I know you've been taken by them many times, and so have I. So My, you've, let me get this straight, you've never met this woman before? Not at all. Not at all. She has no idea who you are. Exactly. I mean, she has no idea of, 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 not only does she not know who you are, but she has no access to figure out who you are. Oh, totally, like nothing. So she's she's saying something which completely startles you, is that a fair? Uh, my jaw dropped. Okay. I'm thinking, is she reading my mind? So, but she looked human. Uh, Totally human. Totally human. Okay. Totally human. At this point. Except for those weird glasses, okay. but then and again. And you dismissed that yeah, with the eye thing. That's right. I'm, okay. I'm thinking something else, right? right? But once she did that, I'm thinking, oh my God, here we go again. It's fast forward 2008 now when this happened, and my encounters back east that got very, very disturbing were in 1993 and 94. I, I got out of Ottawa, drove out from there in two days to Vancouver to get away from this stuff, and this is how many years later? So you were, you were trying to flee the experiences they got the so UFO traumatic, so traumatic back east, I had to get out of there. Okay. Scary, beyond scary. So then this happens, and nothing had happened after I moved out here until I met this lady. Okay. Yeah, that was shocking. Um, she would do things like in the elevator going up to the floor where we're storing her furniture, she would whisper in my ears, in my ear and say, they're listening. I go, who's listening? They're listening. They're listening. I go, who's lis listening? And she goes, them, you know, the greys. She goes, they're always watching. And I told her. And I you never had her, you never no. conversed with any of this stuff. And no. she's coming out and letting I you know. know okay. And starting to spook me and my other assistant. Sure. I said to her, I mean, that's just out of the blue to start doing this stuff. I said, look, I'm here to do a job. Um, you're really starting to creep me out. That's the word I had to use. And that would, I mean, it would creep anybody out. I mean, uh, you would. 
you know, oh, what's going on here? How know. Do, you know, what, what are you talking about? This woman sounds really crazy, certifiable to say things like this. I got the job done. Okay. What I did do, and I, I think it's human nature, I gave her my number. Okay. Because... Mistake number one. <laughs> big mistake number one, and it was just like human interest, and how do you know this stuff? I need to eventually talk to you more. I gave her my number. As you said, big mistake. She phoned me up about a week later and said, oh, I'm just down the road from your place because I told her the area where I live. And she goes, why don't you come down for a drink after work? So I said, sure. I'm with my buddy once again that met her the first time ago. The same guy. Yes. Okay. I said, hey, do you want to come? I'm just going to go home and clean up. And he goes, not a chance. I, he goes, what are you doing? Stay away from that. I said, no, I got to find out just my intuition I've got to find out more about this he goes no I'm not going I went and that's when the strangest thing ever happened in my life and I've had some strange things um, I walked into their place I buzzed up her friend answered the door it was her apartment a beautiful two-story condo right on the Fraser River in obviously in BC and they're both out on the deck and they have these big, big glasses of wine. Now, did, this, did the friend look normal to you? Totally normal. Okay. And she no, introduced no sunglasses? Her, no, no, just normal. Okay. No sunglasses. Right. She, she introduced her friend. We sat down on the deck. She's still wearing those strange glasses. Their glasses of wine are right in front of me on a table. And out of the corner of my eye, I noticed this massive black fly in her wine glass and it's almost like it was stuck to the glass it didn't make sense it wasn't moving and i pointed it to her i said oh look there's a big fly in your wine glass i'll grab some kleenex and get it for you she smiled at me and she goes no i'll get it she put her finger in the wine glass she didn't crush the fly the fly stuck to her finger and she put it towards her mouth and went like this and I just looked at her and I go, holy smokes. So that's the starting of how strange this got and it only got stranger. Uh, from there, she took off her glasses. She got on top of me while, while I was sitting in my chair and she started lifting up my shirt. And I said, what are you doing? And she goes, oh, uh, how old are you? You're well preserved. Let me stop you there. So she, she gets up from the table, she comes up over to you and you allow her now, would that is that like a normal reaction for you? Would you have no? Because I mean, you have a girlfriend at this yeah, time. That's right. So this is kind of weird yeah. that you were allowing her to do this. At first, I was once again You're shocked. Kind of shocked. After the fly thing, she sits on me, and I, and, and, kind of, and I realized she'd been drinking, and so this is not typical behavior for you. No, not at all. Okay, so this um, is something normally you wouldn't you wouldn't mm, allow this. No, okay. I figured it's because she'd been drinking, but it got a little carried away when she started asking me how old I was and the glasses were off as i said she went to kiss me and i pushed her away and her eyes shape shifted now when you say say what, what did they look like before what are they just they normal like? i i don't know if they're brown eyes or they certainly weren't uh like blue eyes or emerald eyes i would have noticed that right away i think they were just normal uh, darker uh, looking eyes but, but the whites were white uh, when i pushed her back when she went to kiss me i pushed her back her eyes shape shifted they went the whites went to a golden color with black streaks and her pupils shrunk I upset her and that's what happened. When I pushed her back, her eyes shape shifted and I pushed her off me. That was my reaction. And I said, what the heck was that? And she gave me the most evil laugh you've ever heard. And I got the heck out of there. In this next segment, you'll hear from two people who've never met, and there's no collusion between them. Yet there are similarities in their stories. What I mean by this, both of them have something, what I call, UFO brain fog. We'll talk more about it after you hear their testimony. Uh, in 1998, 
I was moving to Colorado and I was driving through Kansas, which is very flat. It's a plane. My brother's girlfriend was in the passenger seat. My brother was asleep in the back seat. We're driving, it's like two o'clock in the morning and off in the horizon was a large glowing orb orange it was smaller than the sun orange like the sun but it didn't push out sunlight like the sun would it, it was the, the light was condensed into a ball and it was it looked like it was miles and miles and miles ahead but it was you know pretty big not as big as the sun but pretty big we stared at it for 20 or 30 minutes me and the passenger my brother still being asleep in the back seat we stared at it, we kept staring at it, we stared at it. And in the blink of an eye, the orb went from miles ahead of us, right beside our vehicle, and followed us for a good 15 seconds probably. When the orb came beside us, me or the passenger could not say a single word. We, we both looked over at it. My brother in the back seat even woke up and he looked over at it. And within a few seconds, it just, it was just gone. After it was gone, all three of us, we, we said nothing to each other. We were just, we kind of just stared back at the road and just kept driving. And we ended up going to a rest stop probably an hour, hour and a half later and stopping for a rest. And that's when the conversation got brought up again. Like, what did we see? But after it vanished from our eyes like from the side of the car we didn't say anything we were just we weren't even really in awe we didn't it was like no facial expressions we were just kind of just focused back on driving was a freshman in high school. Me and my sister was in a chapter called Future Homemakers of America, which was a chapter for all girls. We was at a Halloween party at our high school and we had some girls with us that were in a foster home that was not able to attend unless they had a way to and from the, the, the party. So my sister offered to do that and there was 12 of us in the car. As we was dropping the girls off, it got down to where there was just six of us girls. Three of the six were girls that were in current foster care. As we were taking them home, we had saw lights and they were saying it was probably just a truck, someone mud running. And I was telling them that, you know, they weren't familiar with the area and there was no roads there, that it couldn't be a truck that that was a lot of trees and on top of the trees we seen you know a shape and light almost like running lights and we stopped to look at whatever this was and they were saying it was a truck and I explained to them and then they finally realized that it was trees and the object was like hovering over the trees it wasn't moving and that there was multiple lights and we got scared and I'm like I told my sister who was driving I said you need to just go go and she was speeding I remember her speeding but it was like we weren't moving and as we finally got to the house to drop the foster girls off the foster mother came out and was cursing us and said that we were hours late and as I looked at my watch there was no way that we were hours late because we had left the school approximately 30 40 minutes prior to that and already had dropped off six girls but according to the mother, we were hours late and she was irate. And we all, to this day, have talked about these memories and we know that we've seen a UFO or something that was not ordinary. And we all now are in our 30s and 40s and still all remember this. And that was what I believe to be a, U a UFO. So let's examine the testimonies from these individuals. Three people driving in a car in Kansas in the middle of a night experiencing something which is absolutely phenomenal. This large orange orb comes next to the car and paces it for 15 seconds. Then the orb leaves. And these folks sit there and concentrate on driving. That's not a normal reaction. There's no way. Can you imagine if it happened to you? You'd be, you'd be talking about it. You'd be going, oh my God, what was that? You stop the car, you get out, you'd look. No, we just concentrated on driving. That is completely irrational. UFO brain fog, in my opinion. Then we have the woman's encounter. We were speeding, but we weren't going anywhere. 
She tells her sister, let's go, quick, get out, get out. And her sister, and, and she goes, we were speeding, but we weren't going anywhere. That's impossible. The key here is when they get back to the foster mother's home. And the woman comes out and she's irate because they are hours late. They had missing time. They don't know the people who were taken, who were speeding and not going anywhere, had missing time. They're hours late. The phenomenon is real. And UFO brain fog sets in and, and you, can, you can hear it. We were speeding, but we weren't going anywhere. That's not a rational statement. Folks, this phenomenon is real. And there are people that you know that have actually had experiences like this and are too afraid to come forward. However, the veil has been now lifted off. And we can pretty much talk about everything related to UFOs. Why? Because it's all over the media. Once again, this is the coming great deception. You had an experience while you were flying. Tell me about that. I did. I was flying from Lima, Peru oh. to Mexico City. Okay. And the captain hit my left arm and said, what do we have here, Dennis? And I looked up and uh, I saw a very bright light uh, about 40 degrees off our left uh, of our nose, about 10 degrees above the horizon. And uh, very quickly uh, we could discern that it was coming towards us directly towards us and uh, this what light this one light turned into two lights as uh, an automobile does as it comes closer sure. to you and uh, very quickly it turned into beams of light and uh, there was a beam that was pointed forward relative to our our, our direction as it stopped uh, beside us as it came in directly towards us at a very fast speed. Very high. Between the lights, there were uh, a row of windows, maybe 18, 20 uh, windows that were rectangular. They weren't round, but the perception we got was that it was very close. So it was pacing with you? It was there. formating, uh, okay, formation for flying, yeah. Okay. And for, for quite a while, it, it's... And how long did the craft pace with the... Uh, it, uh, we figured about seven minutes. Seven minutes. And then yeah. how did it leave the scene? The beams of light angled down about 30 degrees and increased in intensity mm -hmm. and the thing just shot away. Uh, when you say up shot and away, away it how? just rapidly disappeared. But say 50 miles in five seconds while you're looking at 36,000 miles an hour. It's impossible. We don't have anything like that today. Oh, no, no. It was, uh, it defied the uh, centrifugal force. Did you write a report? Yes. We filled out a, a form from Project Blue Book. Okay. The Smithsonian Institute uh, wrote me. And uh, I think I've got, I think I've got a, a report in there as well. Obviously, it's something that is real and it happens and uh, we should communicate it. I filmed this video out of the window, my living room window of my trailer. And basically, I, I didn't even realize it. Just, I just looked out the window for no apparent reason, just to check on the surroundings outside, I see this white thing in the sky, and it's brighter than normal. And at first thought, I was like, man, that's, that must be Venus, because, you know, this is January, and it's in the western, southwestern sky, this is Venus. And it's like, no, it can't be Venus, that thing is huge. So, and you're thinking, okay, Venus and Saturn are kind of aligned, like they are kind of right, or they was, a few months ago which makes it bigger but this thing was huge and it, it was well I didn't know until I started using the camera but this thing was moving around and shifting and all kinds of things so this was on January I believe January 22nd of 2009 when I, I filmed this out of my window it would move in and move out it would shift and there was it, the object has like some type of you would almost call them like railroad tracks at the top third of the uh, of the object and uh, just it would move it would shift it would rotate um, then towards the end of the video it almost looked three-dimensional and then it almost looked like it was collar bursting and burning with fire then it would go back to its normal shape now, my name is Randy Clark and uh, about 1965 
I was in a little town in Indiana and uh, playing music with a friend of mine. Came out of his place, went to put my equipment away, and I heard uh, a strange sound like being close to a, uh, a power plant. And I looked at the back of my car. I thought there was some sort of electronic thing going wrong for electric in those days. And then uh, I went to put my amp in the trunk, and I thought maybe that the uh, trunk light was uh, shorting out. And I turned around and looked, and right over the street, at telephone pole high, was this uh, silver sort of a, uh, I guess for a lack of a better name, a cigar-shaped uh, craft, no wings, and it was just very slowly moving um, at a very slow speed like this. And it had uh, three lights on it, light in the front, the two lights on the side that were amber colored. And uh, I took off running toward my friend's house because it quite frankly scared me. And that flight or fight thing, it, it happens real fast. So anyway, uh, hit his door and hollered at him and he came running out big eyed all because he had two children he thought some something happened to them because I was extremely excited we got out the front yard I pointed to the sky and by this time it was to the uh, would have been a little west of his house right but just out in front of that corner of his house he had the same experience he went to take off and run and I grabbed him because I realized it was going away from us. And it just kept going down the street till it got to the end of the street. The craft was probably about 40 feet long, maybe. If, about like that, probably. And probably about, I would think, about 16 to 20 feet wide. Anyway, uh, it got down to the end of the street and it, it bobbled like this and made absolutely no noise and just, disappeared it, it I mean so fast that you could blink and it wouldn't be there but there was no propulsion no noise uh, nothing it just disappeared my name is Terry Staley and I saw a UFO well I when I was 12 years old uh, I was uh, babysitting for the doctor next door and I came out about oh it's probably about 10 in the evening and um, I was walking across the driveway to my grandmother's house and I looked up in the sky and there was a uh, formation of probably I'd say about 12 of them there was uh, oh maybe three or four across and then the rest of them tailed behind and uh, the doctor saw me looking up in the sky and so uh, she walked out and she looked up and uh, then my mother and grandmother walked out and they saw and then uh, we watched them for a little while and they were all flying in a formation and, and um, then we saw an airplane come through and saw it flashing red and green and the minute that um, the airplane came close to these things they just all scattered. My name is Dr. Roger. I'm relating an activity that happened to me back in July of 2014 while I was living up in Silver Spring, Maryland. And what happened to me as I was driving home into our, our driveway, which is kind of a secluded property with no lights or no anything around it, is that I was driving down the driveway and going into the garage and noticed something out the corner of my eye uh, up above the neighbor's property, which is next to us. And I stopped the car, uh, got out of it, and started to take a look at what was going on and saw three or four orbs that were up in the sky doing circles and, and erratic movements up and down in circular motion. Uh, it was, seemed rather odd to me. Uh, so I felt no fear, no, um, no kind of uh, anxiety or anything at seeing this. I just kind of said, oh wow, there's some lights out there. And I thought to myself too that this is kind of weird. Um, and went to take a little look and walked up to my backyard which would have been a little bit closer and these orbs were about 100 200 feet off the ground uh, to my right as i look at, at it 
and I thought that this is really, really strange because they didn't make any noise. It was just movement going around and up and down and moving all around. Three or four of them, I can't recall exactly how many, um, but there was at least three. And at that time I was thinking, hey, maybe someone's just playing with our minds and using a flashlight or something like that. But it was not because it's, the property was right next to us. There was nobody around in the whole area. Um, and it was just the movements of these orbs was just really erratic. People come up to me at conferences and tell me stories that they've never shared with anyone else. You're about to hear one such story by a gentleman who would not come on camera, but I believe his testimony is true, which is why I included it here. He talks about deep underground military bases and military personnel working side by side with what can only be described as the Greys. Here is his testimony. I spent 28 years working uh, in top secret classified military intelligence operations. And uh, one of the most honest men that I worked with that's about 60 years old was over my home six months ago and said he has a brother-in-law that works in a similar compartment of top secret classified operations and that he actually works somewhere in the southwest in a desert area with, with these aliens because I was trying to explain to him about what I've been learning through you and through these conferences about what are these UFOs and aliens? They're really demonic angels mm -hmm. that are coming in and out of these dimensional portals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he actually confirmed in my home that his brother-in-law works in another area of the government that we can't talk about, but it dealt with these aliens and that he works side by side with them. Did he I, describe what they looked like to No, you? he just told me what he has heard through his brother-in-law who also wouldn't uh, exaggerate or pull his chain. Did his brother-in-law uh, state whether he felt they were benevolent or malevolent? Uh, or we didn't get into didn't that. Get into he was all. very careful just to give me a hint, a hint that as I was explaining things I've learned through mm -hmm. you and my own experiences in life, um, that his brother actually works with these non-human elements, entities, entities yeah, exactly. Yeah. And did he, did he give you a, is it ongoing now? I get the impression that yeah, I, this was going on. I still talk to this gentleman okay. who, was to, who retired and came back into the world we worked in. And uh, yeah, this stuff is continuous. Continuing. Thank you yeah. for being bold and courageous and coming on the record. You're welcome, sir. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, one thing I'm really curious, you know, you, you've been following the whole UFO phenomena for a number of years. Yeah. Uh, do you think, first of all, disclosure is is eminent? And what do you think these these craft are? And it's just preparing the minds of the people. And you look at other documents, even government documents, that's their plan, is they really believe that uh, uh, just to, years ago to spring this on the American people or people around the world at large, they'd freak out. And so you have to slowly, step by step, incrementally get them into that mindset. And I really think that Hollywood, too, is being used as that propaganda tool to sure. get used for that kind of a scenario. Uh, so that's the propaganda issue and the step-by-step -step issue. But certainly, you look at some other documents, and uh, it's happening. You got, of course, uh, the Vatican's involved in this uh, as well, believe it or not. And also, you look at, uh, you know, even just the recent uh, with the WikiLeaks uh, dump. Uh, right smack dab in one of the emails to John Podesta was sure. talking about imminent disclosure, again with the Vatican, working with the countries around the world for a space treaty. And this is the actual document. We're not making this up. There's no conspiracy theory here. It's right there. So imminent disclosure, I think, is uh, ramping up. Uh, and, uh, you know, I hold to the thing that if, in fact, UFOs, uh, aliens, that whole s scenario is, in fact, going to be used as an excuse to explain away the rapture of the church, uh, then... Um, Wow, uh, we don't know the day nor the hour, but if you see the events of imminent disclosure uh, ramping up, uh, how much closer is that event mm -hmm. uh, that the church needs to be aware of? But as far as our identity, yeah, it is something that I've had uh, a passion for, actually, uh, even before I got saved. I've been saved 23 years at the time of this recording. And uh, but before I got saved, unfortunately, I come from a non-Christian background. Uh, I got involved into the occult and new age, and right. wonder, wonder who shows up when you get involved in that stuff. It's unfortunately aliens, demons, UFOs, that whole nine yards. And of course, the new age uh, instructed to channel and do that stuff and become a medium, which God forbids in the scripture, obviously, because it's demonic. I didn't know. You couldn't have convinced me at the time. 
And uh, of course, being co uh, a coach that these things, you invite them to come inside you to speak through you. Now, mm -hmm. they wouldn't, uh, you know, say that, hey, we're a demon or we're some uh, horrible, you know, force. We're here to possess you and take you over your vocal cords. Of course not. Uh, the new age term to seduce people is you can be, these are our space brothers. Because there was remote viewers who were working for the government years ago who were supposed to be remote viewing like Russian spy secrets and they, much to their surprise, ended up remote viewing some alien entities. And, and, and so that's why I think it's relevant that I mention that in my life I'd been uh, practicing developing my psychic ability and I was working on um, you know, doing a movie about the life of Jim Morrison from The Doors and I, much to my surprise, ended up you know, getting some spirit communication from Jim Morrison's spirit, I believe. And why that's relevant is that while I was, you know, exploring psychic ability in other dimensions of reality with spirits and ghosts or call you, you know, whatever you want to call it, I stumbled upon that I could also have communication with other type of what I think is an alien energy or alien beings in a similar dimensional situation as you would with psychic ability. Uh, they're from the star system Pleiades, or they're orbiting planet Earth. Uh, uh, you had brought it before, and I remember coming across this in the New Age days. The Ashtar Command was sure the Ashtar right? Command, oh, right? And, and that they're here to help us in the time of calamity. Well, we know a time of calamity is coming. The Bible calls it the Seven Year Tribulation. Mm -hmm. But they spin it, and they spin it, and thinking that that's why they're here. They're they're our saviors. Uh, Jesus has got it all wrong. And oh, by the way, when you're left behind and you're in those events, um, it's okay. Just hang on. It's Mother Earth cleansing herself. And Tell me about your encounter. This, what did you see? Well, this was before I got saved. Okay. And so, not so surprisingly, I had this encounter because I'm involved in the occult of New Age. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm over there and I'm there with uh, my girlfriend at the time. Uh, that night, the only thing I remember was just like I hear the bang, big loud thunder clap. And after this whole experience was over, I, I remember it's like, wait a second, there's, there's no, nothing on the ground. I thought it, would rain. it was raining. I was like, well, what's going on? So the next thing I know, uh, I woke up from a dead sleep uh, in absolute stark terror. And uh, we're laying side by side there in the bed. And uh, she's in front of me, and my, my uh, chest is up against her back. And she said what woke her up was my chest pounding so hard. Your heart. She's dead asleep, but I was pounding so hard, such a physical response. That Why were you afraid? Up. What was, what was, the, where was the fear coming from? Well, What's the source of the fear? Well, the source of the fear was, man, there's something in this room. And I knew something was in this room. Now and you're wide awake at this point. Uh, yes. Okay. And, and frankly, I didn't want to open my eyes because I knew when I opened my eyes, I'm going to see something horrible. You could just sense it. And just the sensing of the fear was enough. But I went ahead and my heart, boom, boom. And now she's awake at this point, but she's still laying there too. And I'm literally, I don't know if it was paralysis or just could have very well just been, I am immobilized in fear. I just, I, and I didn't want to move because you know, if you move, then they're going to, you know, what's going to happen? Maybe I can just sleep it out, you know, <laughs> yeah, but no. And, but I opened my eyes and, you know, her shoulders right here, and I opened my eyes and I saw two beady eyes uh, staring at me. I don't remember, they were like glowing. I don't remember what color, red or green or whatever. But it was just like, oh no. And then, then man, my heart's really going down. In 2016, I sat down with author lecturer Paul McGuire, who believed, as I did even back then, that we were on the cusp of UFO disclosure. In December of 2017, that happened with Commander David Fravor on Tucker Carlson's show. Since then, there's been a steady stream of people in all forms of media talking about the validity of the UFO phenomena. Here is my interview with Paul McGuire. I absolutely think that there's going to be disclosure uh, in one form or another. I'm, I'm not certain uh, about what that will be. Um, number one is I think we're right on the verge. When I say on the verge, it could happen this year or next year, where the scientific community is going to make an announcement uh, that will reverberate uh, throughout the whole world where they will essentially say that we now have uh, genetic evidence that planet Earth was seeded by some kind of extraterrestrial uh, race X amount of years ago. I'm absolutely convinced of that.
because the theory of evolution is under attack and this still uh, takes place somewhat under the jurisdiction of the theory of evolution but the idea is that we were seeded by uh, an extraterrestrial race. I think an announcement is coming soon. Well, I certainly think a disclosure is imminent, and not just because I say so, but if you, uh, as you've done many a times, have pointed out, there's all kinds of uh, soft disclosure that's going on. There's something definitely going on, and there's reports everywhere of sightings of different things. And so it is, and there are many countries of the world right now that are disclosing, uh, releasing official uh, Ministry of Defense files, our own um, Paul, former, Hare. F Paul Hare, former Defense Minister of Canada, he's been going around uh, Canada and, and the States uh, involved with disclosure. And you can go back to the, to the 1980s, and then they're talking about it in, a, in an imminent kind of a way, uh, in the 1990s, they're talking about it in an imminent, imminent kind of way. It, it's always, we're ready to come. We're, we're almost there. In terms of disclosure, whether it is um, like a fallen angel technology disclosure, because I believe that occult technology exists, fallen angel technology exists, or whether it is a psychological, uh, like a, a project uh, blue beam, where it's some kind of very sophisticated illusion, it would have to be pretty sophisticated. But we're on the verge of something, because we have geneticists saying that we've got uh, the DNA pool of mankind is has extraterrestrial DNA in it. We have this convergence of scientific information. So absolutely, yes, uh, a disclosure is coming. And with the stuff coming out of the Vatican and other sources, it could happen any year now, or any month, actually. In many ways, Al Matthews became the centerpiece of this entire film. Al had been taken, abducted numerous times throughout his life. In this following testimony, you'll hear how Al was driving home from work, and in a matter of seconds, he was switched off. Hours later, he awakened in his car, hundreds of miles from where he last remembered. These entities have a nefarious agenda. They can manipulate space, time, matter, and energy that completely defy our physics. Here is Al's testimony. Al, you had an, another encounter which you talked to me about last night, which was very, um, very alarming, very disturbing, where you were the whole entire car was taken. And, and I've heard stories like this from other people who have been abducted. Not yeah. only were they taken, but the entire car was taken. That's Tell right. us about that. Yeah, and I've heard stories like that too. And I would be the last person that ever thought that would happen to me. I was driving home the middle of summer, another beautiful, beautiful day, no clouds in the sky. Mm -hmm. I take the same exit every time. It's up in Quebec, north of Ottawa. It's called the Tanaga exit. My cottage is five minutes from there. Okay, I'm approaching the exit and I drive past it with no discernment and I feel myself, the only way I can put it is being shut off. I can feel myself slowly being shut off. Now you've had this experience before. Yes. So you know what's about to I happen. I know what's about to happen. And you're terrified or you're happy? I'm no, I, there is no reaction to me. Even missing my exit, it was nothing. That was nothing. It's just, I missed the exit, no discernment and just being slowly shut off. And it's happened so many times, it takes three to four seconds to shut you off. That's then, how many times it's happened. Well, and then what happens? Then what happens is, I don't know. It was hours and hours later. This was around 6 p.m. in the evening, in the summer. It doesn't get dark out till about 9, 9.30. And the next thing I know, I'm in my car, lowered in the brightest beam of light you've ever seen in your life, the brightest, whitest light, in my car, vibrating. Just vibrating like this, in this light, as the car is floating down to the ground. All I see is black around me outside the light. The car, it sounds crazy, the car started itself and I'm watching it steer on these winding roads in the dark and I'm just looking at it. It was probably maybe 10 seconds. I had a calmness come over me from being vibrating to put my hands up and start steering the car. I'm steering and I'm looking, where am I? It's pitch black out. I looked at my watch. It was a quarter after 10. 
That's four hours of missing time. The first sign I saw was Manawaki, 10 kilometers. That's 120K from my cottage. So you, you were completely in another, in another area? Gone, gone. And were you, what was your reaction when you realized where you were, when you were back in the car? Absolutely traumatized. I found my way home. I went into the fetal position crying, saying, why me? What is this? Why are you doing this to me? And I, I got the hell out of there. I moved. Since you, since you came to Jesus, has these experience stopped? Yes. I've had little things, what I call little things, of seeing ships. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen triangles, boomerangs. I've talked and counseled other abductees from my experiences. And I've noticed even uh, one gentleman, I won't mention his name, very well spoken in the banking industry. Our encounters are almost identical. Mm. And now he's turned his life around. He thought they were aliens. So he, he's come to Jesus also. He has. He reads the Bible all the time. He's because a Because he realized person. this is supernatural. It's totally. It's totally. What would you say to pastors who um, don't want to tell their congregation about this? And yet there are people in their congregation who have seen lights in the sky, who have had encounters. Maybe they're Maybe they've been taken like you were. What, what do you say to those guys? What would I say to them? It's time to wake up. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. This stuff is all around the world now. It's in the Bible. The warnings are in the Bible. Do not ignore them. Do the right thing. People need to know. They need to know. They need to know. Yeah. What would be your closing thoughts? What would you, what would you tell someone who, who um, who's been immersed in this who've been taken several times let's say and believes that these entities are good benevolent what, what would you say to them um they need to do their homework because they're not they're deceivers they're compulsive liars they're evil there's good angels and now i obviously know there's bad angels and i've been helped by the good ones and i'm not the only one there's many people people need to do their homework and research this stuff and realize the deception that's going on with this is off the charts. Thanks for coming on the record. My pleasure. I really appreciate it. Thank you. God bless you. Great. God bless you too. Richard Shaw and I made 10 films in the Watcher series. Rick was the director and producer of the series. It'll be two years this coming August since Rick passed very unexpectedly. In all of those films, we featured Dr. Roger Lear. Dr. Lear was a podiatrist. He was also one of the first people ever to extract what we believe is an alien implant. And we show that in one of the films. The following clip that you're about to see was taken in Dr. Roger Lear's office. And Dr. Roger is talking about his encounter with a UFO in Turkey. In my opinion, this is the best UFO footage ever taken. But it's such a phenomenal footage. It's not, not been labeled by me. Yeah, but it's been labeled by uh, not only video analysts but researchers in the field as being the best I agree. Uh, f f f photography yeah. of a UFO and Ever. documents I, that we're I agree. ever taken. I, I concur. And, and don't you think also that as a matter of habit or, or whatever it may be that when people see things and it looks too good, they say, it can't be real. Sure. Cognitive dissonance kicks in. Right. I can't be looking at what I think no. I'm looking at. No.
There is a book unlike any other book on this planet. Most of you know it as the Bible. And the moment I say that word, some of you cringe back. I get that. I call it the guidebook to the supernatural because, in fact, that's really what it is. There are prophecies from the first book to the last book, from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Those prophecies speak out and call with great specificity events in the future. There's no other book like it. That begs the question, someone is outside of space-time as we know it, calling out the end before the beginning and the beginning before the end, just like prophecy tells us he will. The bottom line is this, we are in a cosmic war. Some of you may or may not believe that. These ships that just appear and then disappear, that defy the laws of physics, that manipulate space-time, matter, and energy. What are we looking at here? The guidebook of the supernatural tells us exactly what we're looking at here. These are, in my opinion, the fingerprints of the supernatural, the fingerprints specifically of the dragon. He's coming back for a last stand. This is why I call it the coming great deception of a Luciferian endgame. So you say, okay, LA, well, I've been abducted, I've been taken, how do I stop it? You just ask. You ask and you receive. You believe on the one who was sent here. His name is Jesus. You ask him into your heart. It's very simple. There's no magic formula. You just ask him. And then you pray. You say, you know, Father, I've, I've done stuff in my life that I'm not proud for. Please come in and change it. If you're being taken, go to him. Cry out to him and say, Father, please stop this. I don't want this in my life. In the name of Jesus, please stop it. Invite him in. It happened to me over 40 years ago, and my life has never been the same, and more than likely never will be again. And I thank God for that. Again, it's not religion. It's a relationship with the Son of God and the Father through the power of the Spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. It's available to you. All you have to do is ask. If this resonates with you in any way, shoot me an email, la at lamarzulli.net. Give me your phone number. I'll call you up and pray with you over the phone. But you don't need me to do that. You can invite him right here, right now. He has the power to stop all this stuff because he is the king. And the king is going to return. And many of us believe that return is soon. Thanks for watching. Remember, pass it forward.